And here I'm, um, I'm making up a just so story because as I always say, I wasn't consulted at the design phase. And so I, I don't know why it's set up this way. I just know that it is set up this way. Um, one reason to suppress the somatic response, the bodily response, is that tends to be a unitary interpretation, meaning at this moment, I feel alert, but calm. So I feel good, but I'm, I'm guessing there's a lot of signals coming from the body. And in fact, there are to my brain, but I tend to just say, I feel pretty good. In fact, I'm very delighted to be here. So I feel good. Or if I'm very tired, I feel tired. Those tend to be very kind of um, binned responses and they're fairly generic. Whereas your description of what the prefrontal cortex does, which is an accurate one, I should say, of imagining different selves and different outcomes almost requires that we suppress how we feel in our body in the moment. You know, I, I guess we can look to some of our podcasting um, colleagues like the, the Jocko Willinks or the, the David Goggins, you know, who are um, either forcing themselves uh, or are somehow up at 4.30 in the morning and training, pushing through that, what I call limbic friction. You know, the limbic system is saying, I'm tired or I'm anxious and you know, going against that. So there's, there's literally a, a, there, there's a required suppression of the bodily response in order to imagine how we would feel when we complete this or how terrible we would feel. How much of that? How much of that, so let's parse that into two parts, because you could imagine there's an inhibitory component where you're in competition with an underlying urge. So the top-down story is, so for example, if you're responding to something in an irritable way that's being directed to you on Twitter, there's going to be a limbic rage response that's associated with that, which you can then suppress. But then the, the question there that's quite complex, I would say, is something like, to what degree do you think you're directly suppressing that with the prefrontal cortex? And to what degree do you think you're spinning up an alternative self that if embodied wouldn't require that physiological response? And so you're seeing to a new identity in which that limbic response is no longer, um, is no longer germane. Yeah. And so the reason that it disappears is not because you directly suppress it in an inhibitory manner, but because you replace what's necessary physiologically, given your new understanding of the territory that you inhabit. I, I think it's some of both, but I've never been able to, to really like wrestle that through. Yeah, so I think um, what you're getting to is what we know is that the, the prefrontal cortex and its associated networks contain a, a near infinite, if not infinite set of possibilities, right? I mean, if, mm -hmm. it, of course, it's, it's, um, it's, bottlenecked by experience and it's bottlenecked by one's imagination. But, you know, the number of different possible selves that one could imagine is near infinite if one were to spend time on it. Whereas the number of different bodily states that one can have are, are actually very finite. And if you think about the autonomic nervous system and the, and in my laboratory, we've studied this typically in the context of fear and confrontation that uh, the simplest way to put this in a, in a kind of a, um, in a, kind of pop neuroscience way would be to say, you know, we can either be back on our heels, meaning retreating, or we can be flat footed, sort of calm in our stance, or we can be forward center of mass. We can be in sort of pursuit and or competition. There, there really aren't other motor responses for an animal, including humans, right? You can either stay put, right. back up or go forward. You know, and this is yeah. Well, it's useful for people to know that that's the basic platform upon which emotions are erected too. Is that are like signals of those of those action tendencies, and they are very simple. It's back up, get away, stop, or move forward. And so, generally, we associate positive emotion with forward movement, and that would be positive emotion that's dopaminergically mediated fundamentally. Right. And then the halting would be. Well, it can be calmness because there's nothing to do, but it can also be the paralysis that fear induces. And then panic and retreat are more, I, they're sort of on the border between anxiety and pain, I suppose. Pain responses. Yeah, exactly right. It's complicated in, in yeah. Yeah, okay. the, so these three major categories, I think, encompass most, if not all of the possible responses, as you said, and, and probably form the, the base set for all emotions. I mean, my laboratory studied this mainly as a fear and confrontation, and the, one of the reasons we started to explore this was the following. You know, we, we've all heard of fight or flight or rest and digest, right? Those correspond to the alertness system and the, and the calmness system of the autonomic nervous system in their kind of extreme forms. But what we observed in animals and then now in human studies, we published about a year ago, is that 
when people are confronted with an anxiety provoking scenario, in our case, we do this with virtual reality because we need to do it in the laboratory. We find that we find their pain point essentially. And by pain point, I don't mean extreme fear. I mean, the thing that can raise their autonomic arousal that has them in a mode of considering different options and trying to figure out what is strategic and what they're capable of in that moment could be heights, could be confrontation with a predator, animal. It varies by person to people, but everyone has their pain point, even, uh, even Navy SEALs that we brought to the laboratory or other people from the special operations community, they all, each and everyone has their pain point. What they do in response to that pain point is really what's interesting. And what we found was that the pause or freeze response certainly was associated with autonomic arousal, with stress and anxiety. We measure this in the brain and body. But it was the lowest anxiety response. People always think of panic, you know, just being paralyzed in panic. That's actually the lowest anxiety response. Retreat was the next level up in terms of levels of heart rate change and levels of change within the insula of all places. We actually recorded from human insula through a partnership with uh, neurosurgeons. And then we found that there were a subset of individuals and animals in the parallel animal work that would confront a fear, not necessarily reflexively, but after some consideration, they would lean into the challenge, essentially confront the thing that was making them feel. And it turned out that that response surprisingly, was associated with the highest levels of autonomic arousal. And this gate- Right, so, but that would be, that would be heart rate activation particularly? Heart rate activation and- forms of auto- Heart rate activation and a change in what it's called uh, the so-called gamma wave activity in the, we had electrodes in the insula. And what we found was that people who were willing to lean into that challenge- Yeah. There, the insula took on essentially a change in its activity patterns, this gamma pattern, the heart rate increased, breathing increased, sweating increased. So these are all the marks of an anxiety attack. But here, if you were to just look at the behavior of the person or the animal, what you'd find is that they were marching forward toward their, this is the, you know, and so then. That's voluntary exploration. Right. So now you you did an animal study with mice where you showed, if I remember correctly, that the mice that were showing tail flicking, which was a prodroma to that exploratory activity, showed a particular form of brain activity that if you replicated with stimulation was more potently reinforcing than sexual stimulation. Right. So here's where the, the surprise came, the, the additional surprise came in. We thought, okay, wow, well, there are animals. These mice will tail flick in, the, in response to a threat, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is essentially saying, come on, let's go, let's fight whereas other animals would retreat. And that tail flicking um, paralleled within the human studies with people being confronted with it. For somebody who's scared of heights to go through a virtual reality scenario of being up on a high beam between buildings might not sound like a big deal to the average video gamer or to you and me, 